welcome back. Um, today is our uh, is the second talk hosted by the Riot Science Club Exeter. Um, the Riot Science Club is a seminar series that raises awareness and provides training in reproducible, interpretable, um, open and transparent science practices. It started in June 2018 at King's College London. Um, it's an entirely um, uh, early um, career research led and has now um, expanded to uh, St Thomas Hospital, Rotterdam and Exeter uh, with other sites um, coming soon. Um, so just to remind uh, people watching, um, there will be a, a Q&A uh, at the end. So um, at the end of the walk, uh, the, the talk, sorry, <laughs> um, I'll uh, look at the questions and the uh, most voted ones. Um, I'll uh, ask the uh, speaker. Um, so if you um, like a question, please uh, vote on that one. Um, just to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Gavin Buckingham. Um, he was awarded his PhD in psychology from the University of Aberdeen in 2008. Following the completion of his PhD, uh, he moved to Canada to take up a position as a postdoc fellow in the Brain and Mind Institute at the Western University uh, in Canada, working with Professor Mel Goodall. His work here mostly focused on how we perceive weight and interact with objects in the world around us. Uh, and then in January 2013, he was appointed as a lecturer in the psychology department at the Harriet Watt uh, University in uh, Edinburgh. Three years later, he joined the Department of Sport and Health Sciences at the University of Exeter, uh, where he's currently a senior lecturer and leads the uh, object uh, interaction uh, lab. Um, welcome, uh, Dr. Buckingham. Um, Feel free to start. All right, um, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, this is a pretty exciting talk for me to be giving. This is um, pretty far outside my normal wheelhouse of uh, presentations I normally give, um, but I'm really flattered to be invited here. Um, I'm gonna talk probably fairly briefly, as far as these sorts of presentations go, about my journey from not really knowing too much about open science and reproducibility to it becoming a fairly big part of my day-to-day -day research career, as far as I'm concerned. So, um, yeah, Joao gave actually a pretty clear uh, overview of my career here, so I won't um, I won't spend too long going through this side of things. Um, as he said, I'm currently a senior lecturer in sport and health sciences at the University of Exeter, um, but I come from a psychology background. So I've not only switched between several institutions during my career, but I've also um, switched disciplines, which has been quite a eye-opening experience for me as well. Now, my research is kind of focused around how we interact with the world and perceive the world, how we interact with objects with our hands, how heavy things feel when we pick them up, using different devices to fairly precisely measure the movements of our upper limbs. So that's neither here nor there for the concept of open science, but it, it does kind of uh, set the scene a little bit for, you know, why I was kind of interested in this in this topic in the first place. So many of the speakers that these open science and reproducibility seminars uh, get are, you know, are well known. They've contributed to the open science ecosystem in some way, but that's that's not me. You know, I'm not I'm not famous. I'm not influential. I'm not a big name scientist. I work in a fairly niche field. But what I do do is I do spend quite a lot of time on Twitter usually retreating either my science or you know interesting illusions that I find. This is one that's been floating around the internet recently that you've probably all seen by now. But spending all of this time on social media has really allowed me to become kind of immersed in many of the narratives around reproducibility and open science. I probably am not alone here in thinking that 
Twitter is really the place most of us get our information about reproducibility and open science. Now, kind of throughout my career, since since being a PhD student, I've been frustrated by a, a number of things, and I suspect it's my PhD supervisor who has uh, instilled a lot of these frustrations in me. And I see all of these as probably fairly good things to be frustrated about. It means there's a good critical mindset here. But, you know, I, I'm frustrated generally by studies that have particularly small sample sizes. I'm frustrated by the general propensity of um, our field, and I'll sort of talk about, you know, psychology or at least the study of human behavior, broadly speaking, and how difficult it is to publish null findings, this so-called file drawer. I'm also frustrated by the, the grandiose conclusions that not so much that papers draw, but that we are encouraged to draw by the reviewers who review our papers. And indeed the grandiose conclusions that far outstrip the data that are required to even get to the review stage in some of these career making journals, these uh, really prestigious ones. And I'm also frustrated, and this is probably a little bit due to the snobbery of the field I work in, frustrated by some of the manipulations in psychology and some of the dependent variables in psychology. I'm lucky enough that I get to manipulate the physical properties of things in the world, the sizes of objects and things like that, and then I get to precisely measure the kinematics of upper limb movements. And this means that when I'm reading papers that measure things either far less precisely or manipulate things in a far more slapdash kind of way, uh, it kind of has stood out to me for some time. But my biggest frustration with science, I would say, would be with closed book science. This idea that we are somehow supposed to be able to replicate what has gone on in a journal article simply by reading the methods section. This is almost one of these lies that we consistently teach undergraduate students in research methods courses, that the methods section of their dissertation or something like that should really be enough for someone else to replicate the study they themselves are reporting. But given the word limits in journals and frankly, even without the word limits, just the limitations of how you can communicate these things in a journal article without supplementation of the data, the code and the stimuli materials provided to you, it seems almost impossible to genuinely have a good crack at replicating the vast majority of science that we read about. Now to give a bit of background about what has influenced a lot of my thinking on this topic, I mean, most people are um, hugely influenced by BEM's 2011 paper showing fairly compellingly that precognition exists, that we are able to predict the future some 52, 53% of the time in a bunch of reversed psychology experiment paradigms. Now, this came out in 2011 when I first joined Twitter and was an interesting paper for me to read, but I, I have to say I didn't really, really understand the consequence of it. This was kind of fairly midway through my postdoctoral training and I didn't really have a great sense of the research ecosystem. I just thought this is odd. But people have talked about it and it's kind of percolated for a bit. But one of the more interesting recent things that sort of cropped up um, that made me think that maybe the way things are done are just fundamentally wrong was um, Diedrich Staples um, research. So Diedrich Staple, for those of you who don't know, had a bunch of papers retracted after it became clear that he had engaged in a large scale fraud, essentially faking data, creating data, manipulating numbers. And, you know, this this quote here of I was fed up with my own inability to produce anything interesting from my research. I was going round in circles, each study much like the previous one. They were just variations on a theme, complex mediocrity, a small effect here, another one there. I'd had enough of the grind. Thanks to Nick Brown for providing the translation of uh, Diedrich Staples book there, which is free to download there, which I think is a really interesting and insightful read. And then probably the most recent um, thing that is still rumbling on is um, Brian Wansink, a um, 
behavioral economist who's interested in the psychology of food and eating and things like that, among other things, um, wrote this massively ill-fated blog post where he outlines uh, an email he sent to a, a new trainee that she must squeeze some blood out of this rock. She really needs to investigate this data to find something in there to publish. And this basically uh, let a uh, fairly informal but very damning investigation of many of his research practices and um, data sets, uh, which has led to another bunch of retractions as well for him. So there's a lot of things at play with all of these, um, all of these individuals here, um, some of which are around bad research practices. Some of these are about the ecosystem of science that is fairly poisonous in places. Some of them are, I suspect, about not having close enough control of your data simply because you don't have to have close enough control of your data and you can, as a successful lab boss, take a step back from all of these things, which is quite nice in some respects, but also quite problematic if you don't have the right sorts of protocols in place to ensure that everything is as it should be. But it's quite easy for many people in cognitive psychology, which is really where I would see myself as this is this is other people's problems. This is something for the world of maybe social psychology. Certainly, my field is considered to be reasonably robust to things like questionable research practices. Certainly, the measures are precise and hard to alter. There's not too many um, things that would be changed around. The hypotheses are often fairly simple. At least that's how it seems on first glance. In reality, though, I'm not really sure that's the case. It's certainly not robust to altering your hypotheses to fit your data, this idea of harking. And it's certainly not robust to fraud. At the end of the day, we're generally all analyzing numbers and numbers can be fairly, create, fairly easily created. I'm not someone who really believes that large scale fraud is a big problem for science that we need to tackle. I suspect that's a fairly small scale problem and that most scientists are inherently honest people trying to do a good job. But one thing I have observed is that when we are processing our data through the pipelines that we do to get the data from the machinery that we've collected it from to the stat statistics that we report, there's a lot of unique pipelines in play here that vary from lab to lab and not a whole lot of standardization. So many different ways for um, data to end up in a bunch of uh, different outcomes, really. So as I mentioned before, I've moved around a little bit in my career and have taken the not unusual, but certainly not standard step of changing disciplines and moving to a different university in 2016. So I'd been a lecturer for about three years. I'd established my um, my position. I kind of knew what I was doing, had a lab up and running. And moving actually provided me with a great amount of freedom to just completely reboot my system, to really have a think about how my practices were working, what things I could change, because I was in many ways starting from scratch, but without that kind of frantic first lecturer, I'm trying to keep afloat all the time feeling. I felt fairly confident in what I was doing and I wasn't really feeling too much like I was sinking anymore when I moved to this new position. So it, I kind of had the breathing space to think about this and it was just a really good time in my career for learning about all of these things. Now, I suspect that I'm not going to be needing to convince anyone in this audience of this, but you know, why is it worth thinking about altering your research practices? Well, for one, having a step towards reproducibility and open science, it, it'll keep you honest. It will you know, stop you eventually drifting down these almost dystopian career paths of people like Diedrich Stapel or Brian Wansink, who I'm sure once upon a time never imagined that they themselves would be drifting in this sort of direction either. More importantly, though, I feel that it does do something for not just the credibility of your research. You probably imagine that people read your papers and, you know, believe the findings that you publish. Increased amounts of clear pro reproducibility and open science efforts will definitely make this more the case. But also the credibility of your field. 
psychology, behavioral science in general, the study of human behavior is coming increasingly under criticism. People are starting to believe the facts of scientists less as the problems of particular earlier research start to come to light. And this is problematic for a whole number of reasons. It's also quite practically helpful. If you are forced to release your data out to the world, you are forced to really understand your data and to organize your data in a proper, useful kind of way. Certainly me as a principal investigator, my data management skills are frankly a liability. I have endless amounts of Dropbox folders and um, Microsoft OneDrive folders and trying to dig up data to help one of my students conduct a meta-analysis or something like that is almost a nightmare. So some of the changes that I was able to make to my general research ethos happened actually fairly naturally as a consequence of some of the things that are sort of baked into my job at the University of Exeter here. A typical ethics form in a psychology department is a fairly brief affair where you will be describing what it is you're doing and expect someone to make a judgment about whether that seems ethical, ethically appropriate and whether you've made the correct sorts of mitigations. Now, the ethics form in my department at the University of Exeter is absolutely vast. It's uh, 20 pages long in its blank format asking for a clear articulation of things like the research question and some amount of background and a clear articulation of what will we know basically after the study has been done. It asks you to outline the primary and secondary objectives of your study, all the primary objectives you're going to look at, the method you're going to use and the statistics that you're going to use to analyze these data. And it also asks you, assuming that you're not one of our undergraduate or taught postgraduate students, to conduct a power analysis to justify your sample size. And there are many ways to do this, but the preferred way is justifying the based on the effect size that you are anticipating uh, finding based on pre previous research. So this really forces you to engage with some of these tricky questions, almost like a pre-registration early on in the research process. Now, I won't lie, this was just horribly painful when I started here. It seemed like such overkill, huge amounts of drama to go through. Filling out the ethics form takes almost as long as writing a paper. But once you've done all of this, the paper itself is considerably easier to write. And frankly, the study I suspect is a lot better. We also have some facets of um, good research practice kind of baked into some of the undergraduate coursework. Now our final year students, just like most students in sports science and psychology, will all conduct a final year dissertation where they are going to conduct some sort of research project. What we have our undergraduate students do in the second year research methods course that I took over teaching is to essentially perform a soft pre-registration of their final year dissertation, what we call a research design exercise, where they give a little lay summary, like an abstract, provide a fairly short introduction on the topic, a clear articulation of the hypothesis, a description of the methods, all the usual sorts of stuff, but a analysis plan, a description of what it is that you're going to do to test those hypotheses that you laid out in the previous section. And then most recently, something we've been doing over the last couple of years as well is asking undergraduate students to simulate the data in their coursework as well, simulate the data that they could collect for their final year dissertation. So this means that not only are we forcing them to have a really clear understanding of their hypotheses, when they're eventually paired up with a dissertation supervisor, the dissertation supervisor almost has a pre-registered version of the project that the student is going to conduct. Now, in many ways, this isn't that important. It's not that often that an undergraduate dissertation will go on to be published. But in the cases when an undergraduate dissertation does go on to be published, it certainly means that the science that underpins it is going to be better than it would be beforehand. 
And it also means the quality of the dissertations themselves are just somewhat better than they would be um, without this soft form of pre-registration. So what are the sorts of concrete first steps that I was making in the, um, the drifting into the world of open science and reproducibility? Well, for many people, the first step you'll make is a preprint. So either as soon as you finish writing an article or as soon as you submit it for publication, you will put it up on BioArchive or SciArchive or any of those other um, preprint repositories. This is never something I've been that interested in. I think it's fine in principle. I'm not at all worried about being scooped, someone else reading my paper and stealing the idea and publishing it before I do. That just seems massively unlikely. And, you know, I'd love to get some feedback from people on my papers that I do put up as preprints. But I did put up a preprint once and I received uh, no feedback and it was only read by something like 17 people. So I was a bit less enthusiastic about that idea in general. I'm also, uh, perhaps in a slightly unpopular kind of way these days, a big believer in peer review. I feel that almost every single paper I've had published has been improved through the peer review process. But I do really feel that postprints are extremely valuable because what I care about is widening participation in science. And the idea that someone at a university that doesn't have a subscription to my journal or an individual who wants to follow up something they've read in a newspaper article um, by tracking down the source material, somehow can't get access to that, I find very frustrating. And of course, it's simple to say, well, they could just email the author, but that's not the sort of thing that would occur to that many people. Putting a postprint on a website, personal website, university repository, or even open science framework, really removes all of these sorts of barriers. And I, I think that's really what this is all about as far as I'm concerned, spreading the science around without putting too many barriers in the way. I'm a action editor at PLOS One and a big fan of open access um, publication in general, but this is definitely not for everyone. I'm a researcher who does not have funding for the vast majority of the time, so simply can't afford to publish in most open access journals. But one interesting thing happened to me um, about a year into my position at Exeter. It was mentioned to me that we have an agreement with Springer, meaning that we can publish all of the articles in Springer journals with gold open access, just as something that our library has agreed with that particular publisher. This is not something that was well advertised or particularly well known, um, but you should always in an institution ask your library if there are any open access agreements with publishers because if you are publishing the sort of work that could go to any number of journals, why not make it open access, especially if you can do it for free? The other thing that I've been doing more and more recently is open code and really encouraging my trainees to upload all the code that they do for their analyses, even if it's something just as simple as running a t-test or an ANOVA, or a more complicated pipeline of research. I think it's very important to have it very clear how this data was pre-processed, not least so someone can completely replicate your analysis and find mistakes in it. But the thing that's not really talked about so much more is someone else should be able to use your code. I think we often get very protective of the code that we've written and the time we've sunk into figuring out how to do this particular processing pipeline or this elegant sort of statistical analysis. But ultimately, there's no point holding it back from anyone else. You will facilitate other people's science. They might thank you. They might include you in something. But frankly, even if they don't, you're still making the world a better place, particularly in the context of science here. Now, I don't do this very well. My students do it far better than I do. What I have is a fairly soft option where I have analysis code uploaded onto my website with a bit of a wiki of how to use it. What I should really be using is GitHub and version control and updating and improving my scripts all the time with direct links to the particular versions in individual papers.
The other thing that I'm um, doing far more frequently these days is looking at open data and using open data. So as I mentioned before, my data management skills are quite poor and this I suspect resonates with many of you. Putting your data up online in the form of a data set and open science framework with the idea that someone else should be able to download and use that data, this becomes a form of self-help. If I'm trying to find a data set, or frankly, even if I'm trying to find one of my papers, the quickest way now is just to Google it. And that always gets me to where I need to so much quicker than digging through my old file structure. Also, if there's anything that this uh, COVID situation has taught me, it's about the scientific value of secondary data. And I've started to be involved in more meta-analyses from a context of contributing data to a meta-analysis that I wasn't involved in, and now being involved in the preparation of meta-analyses using data that I've also contributed to. So I've seen it from both perspectives there. And the ease with which someone conducting a meta-analysis can get to their outcomes and answer their scientific question if the data is available, rather than having to dig through a paper and try to understand and uh, work out the various effect sizes. It's just night and day. Now, it's always worth mentioning that this idea of open data is a popular one, but it's actually quite challenging. You need some very strong language and some clear language in the consent form. And you also need to really understand the difference between anonymized data and pseudonymized data. Um, these are really quite challenging concepts to wrap your head around. And um, I've got a link here to a really nice uh, page from the University of Bath, actually. Their library services has a very effective um, description that I think deals with a lot of these issues and gives you some sense of what the best practices are, particularly in the context of the open science framework. Probably the most recent step I've been making would be around pre-registration. So pre-registration, as I've alluded to before, is this articulating of the various important parts of your study, in particular the hypotheses, the measures, and the analyses. There are many different ways to do this. By far the simplest, I would say, is using as predicted. So all you do is go to aspredicted.com and you get these fantastic templates that ask you whether or not you've collected the data, what's your hypothesis, and then what are the conditions, what are your dependent variables, what analyses will you do on these? You fill out as many as you want, you fill them out in as much detail as you want. And then you can click a button and that is saved privately until you want to release it to the world. For many studies, an as predicted template might be a little bit too simple or a little bit too constraining. What I actually prefer is a more free form type of pre-registration where you almost, a bit like this coursework I outlined earlier, write the front end of your paper in a future tense kind of form. It's a little bit of the study background and prior data that can form the basis of an introduction, a brief outline of the methods that you're going to be doing, and then a specific articulation of the analyses that you're going to conduct on, um, on the data once it has been collected. But there are many types of registration. Open Science Framework itself is a really nice repository um, for looking at all of these things. And there are many different types of pre-registration you can choose from here, from this open-ended registration to the OSF pre-registration, which is a bit like an as-predicted template. And then you can get to the point where your open science framework page for a particular project starts off with just a pre-registration document and then ends up being this complete repository for everything you could ever want to know about the project, including the author's accepted manuscript, the script that did the analyses, the data, the scripts that did the pre-processing. It's kind of one-stop shop for anyone who wanted to know anything more detailed about your research than you were able to report in the paper.
And I want to kind of end up talking about some of the challenges that I faced and that I feel the field kind of faces a little bit briefly. So registered reports are a big challenge as far as I'm concerned. Most of you, I'm sure, will know what a registered report is, but for those of you who don't, it's like a pre-registration but supercharged. So you develop your idea, you design your study, you write up what is called a stage one report where you're outlining what it is you're planning to do and how you're going to do it and what you're going to do with that data once it's collected. And that stage one report is reviewed by reviewers. They make suggestions and changes and you make the changes as a consequence of those um, uh, suggestions until the stage one report is accepted. And then you move into this phase of collecting and analyzing your data, knowing that you're guaranteed a publication, assuming that you stick to what it is you said you were going to do when you come to write your final stage two report and publish it. So that's actually a really kind of nice, reassuring place to be in. But it's not for everyone and it's not for every question. In my opinion, you need a really clear question. You need a clear method a clear pipeline and a clear analysis. It needs to be something that you are very sure about. You can't just be striking out into the dark with the registered report. Otherwise, you'll find yourself rather frustrated and deviating from your pre-registered plan more times than not. Now, this is fine. You're able to deviate from a pre-registered plan, but better to not, generally speaking. The other challenge with a registered report is coming up with a good, clear sample size calculation. I find many of the journals are very, very prescriptive in how this needs to be done. Yet, given that it's quite hard to determine what the effect size should be based on prior, possibly unreliable research, given that we are fairly uncertain about what the size of a particular effect might be, and given that the grounds do seem to be shifting for what an appropriate effect size is for a particular um, uh, study to warrant investigation, this is something I've always found quite challenging. It also puts a ticking clock on data collection, which is a little uncomfortable for some people. Certainly, um, we've been derailed a little bit by COVID with registered reports. Um, this isn't generally a problem, but this delay between writing the front end of a paper and actually being able to write the back end of a paper is quite unusual. This upfront delay, in fact, is actually quite uncomfortable as well. I think that many people's intuition would be to get a first year PhD student collecting data on a project that you've almost designed for them first off to help them get going, to get something on their CV, to get them some skills in the lab and kind of worry about the writing a little bit later on forcing the writing to the beginning of the project in a way that is going to be read by reviewers. That's that's an uncomfortable transition for some people. They don't really have too much time to learn the, the skill of writing and get a sense of how you two might work together. But uncomfortable is maybe not the best, not the worst thing in the world either. On the upside, I mean, it's clear that registered reports are are interesting you know they are um they make the study design stronger this recent preprint print has just um, appeared showing that blind peer reviewers are ranking articles that are registered report higher on almost all metrics than non-registered report articles you don't have that same incentive to pad out the discussion some of these problematic things we've been talking about before and um, I completed my first registered report last year, um, and it's it's really quite an exciting process. After you've published enough papers, the process is maybe not so exciting anymore. Registered report was a really interesting process for me, and you know really did make me think and reflect on how I do my science. The other challenge that I really haven't got a good handle on yet is how do I deal with my old data? Because not only is it poorly organized, there's also no real consent for data sharing. Simply because that wasn't the sort of thing you asked on consent forms back when I started my career as a lecturer or as a postdoc. But it seems a shame for this data just to be hiding away. It is still potentially useful. 
And one thing that I'm quite excited about investigating are um, this idea of synthetic data sets that um, Daniel Quintana has talked about in a recent paper, where you modify data to maintain all of the statistical properties, um, but are new and independent, at least as I understand the concept. So this is something I'm looking forward to educating myself on a little bit more over the coming years to see if I can salvage some of these old data sets and bring them back to life. And the last thing I wanted to talk about is a, I guess a slightly bigger issue that I see in the open science world. And I see there being two camps developing in the world of open science and reproducibility. On the one hand, we have the group of scientists who feel that their number one priority and frankly, the number one priority of all scientists should be what is good for science. And on the other side, we have the group of scientists who are very more of the opinion that they should be looking out for their trainees. What is going to be good for my trainees? And this kind of tension between big scale and small scale, must someone really be sacrificed for good science to prevail? Is something that there needs to be a comfortable middle ground met on. I think probably the only way for this to happen will be for those in senior senior roles to change the game, frankly, to start to concretely reward reproducibility efforts. And we're starting to see things like that emerging. Just this morning, um, came across a job advert from University of Bristol in their psychology department, which has listed as an essential skill, a willingness to engage with open science practices and a commitment to research reproducibility. reproducibility. So this means that if you have not engaged in open science practices or have not shown some clear commitment to research reproducibility, this very prestigious university is not interested in hiring you. And that's the sort of thing that we really need to see more of from funders, from individuals who review grants, from individuals who award grants. Got a couple of resources here. I mean, I'd like to thank all the members of my lab um, in particular um, who have spent a lot of time um, dragging me into the more concrete aspects of the world of open science. But Joao and Eli Hassan in particular um, is becoming the, the real lab uh, guru on open science and has a really nice presentation on data management using open science framework that I've got a link to. If you're just going to read one thing on open science from the perspective of an established lecturer, I'd recommend you read this new paper by Kowalczyk and colleagues, um, this What Can Senior Academics Do, do to Support Reproducibility, uh, Reproducible and Open Research. And I've also included the links here for Stork Kinesiology, the Society for Transparency, Openness and Replication in Kinesiology, for those of you in sports science and the Society for Improvement of Psychological Science for those in psychology. Joining both of these institutions for fairly trivial amounts of money that you could certainly think about asking your supervisor or your department's director of research to contribute um, to is the sort of thing that will open doors for you that probably wouldn't be there otherwise. And I do really feel that the world is turning on the uh, um, the corner is about to be turned on the world of reproducibility and open science and uh, getting on board with this is going to be one of the really valuable things you can do for your career fairly early on. All right, well thank you very much for listening and I'm looking forward to hearing the questions you have and I'd also love to hear any suggestions you might have as well about how I can further improve my practices and drag myself even further into this ecosystem of open science. Thank you, Gavin. <laughs> that was, yeah, thank you very much. That was a really interesting uh, talk. Um, we've got um, a few questions. <laughs> um, I'll start, um, yeah, I'll start with the, the most voted one. So uh, I gave a talk to senior academics about about how they can engage in open science. One of the responses was roughly, we already have a correction mechanism in science, meta-analysis. 
a meta-analysis -analysis, um, weighs up the evidence and gives you a more confident idea of the validity of published evidence. I didn't have a killer comeback, possibly because I never heard of any saying basically, if only we had more meta-analysis, we will not, we wouldn't have a replication crisis. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, my my view on this would be, we have an awful lot of meta-analyses out there, and science still seems to have many problems. What I would say as well is that a meta-analysis is really only analyzing with any degree of certainty the published literature. So there are statistical methods to account for the file drawer problem, these things that are um, found but never published, these probably thousands of undergraduate dissertations every year around the world that are never published. And a meta-analysis for me is always going to miss out, it's going to be the tip of the iceberg that it ever has any insight into. So I'm kind of on board with the meta-analysis, maybe giving some sense of what's a good overview of the um, the stuff that's out there in the world at the moment. But I'm uh, one of these people that feels that a good registered report of a well-designed study and a sensible theoretical framework, that's going to be top of a pyramid of evidence, or even better, a meta-analysis of registered reports. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, so, um, someone saying, I know of senior academics who have been penalized for engaging in uh, open science. Presumably, this was because their work seemed like they were asking impolite questions about the credibility of their colleagues' research. Science should be a disinterested pursuit for truth, but this is not always possible. Um, so the question itself is, how can you encourage engagement uh, from your colleagues without triggering kickback from colleagues who feel threatened? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question and uh, not one I have a great answer to, I'm afraid. I think it does come back to some degree to this idea of how important is science versus how important is careers. I think that individual academics are invested to a greater or lesser degree in their own theories and their own outcomes, but not in my optimistic view from the perspective of their own ego, more because they're concerned about being able to pay the, their postdocs next month's salary or something like that, you know, bringing in the grants as the income of their trainees. And I think that most people are appropriately worried about their trainees' futures in science that's a long-term future, but also a short-term future. And bringing in grant income based on your reputation will facilitate that. So I think that's why people are often defensive about it. I do think that there are ways in which you can approach these conversations with colleagues that would make this easier. And I certainly see lots of discourse on Twitter where people are uh, gleefully uh, shouting about the, uh, the weaknesses of other people's research. And I think that that kind of uh, discourse usually doesn't improve things. And I think a perhaps an uncomfortable middle ground and a nudging people towards compromise and helping them see the limitations of their own research is more the way to go than simply pointing out that someone's study that they did was probably nonsense. OK, <laughs> thank you. Um, if yeah, well, if, uh, I've got a question as well, I think. <laughs> and um, it, again, like um, you already mentioned that, so I'm, I'm one of Gavin's PhD students. So uh, but the question following what you're saying, so the, the talk, the whole talk itself, um, it's very um, accusation free, very guilt free. So more of a self introspection of uh, what we can do to engage with open science. So I'm just curious about um, so did this kind of approach. Was there like a 
specific timing in your career or was this like part of the lab culture? Um, I think that um, there was not so much a, a specific turning point or anything like that. I think the move to Exeter allowed me to examine a lot of the practices that I did and I developed a lab website with a fairly big wiki section about how to set up my technical side of things and this made I should maybe come up with a fairly lengthy wiki about how I analyze my data and how I formalize my pipeline. A lot of this was just a practical, how can I make my trainees lives a little bit easier so I don't have to have the same explanation with dissertation students year after year after year or something like that. Um, and yeah, I, I think I think beyond that, um, I, I, I presume that there's a lot of credit to my mentors throughout my career as well, who must have, you know, implicitly given me a lot of these uh, <laughs> wants to improve the reproducibility of my research anyway. And, you know, I, the department itself is very supportive of these sorts of things. It's a very collegiate department. And yeah, my trainees have also really helped drag me in this direction as well. Thank you. Um, the next question from uh, Lisa. Um, what is the problem with sharing fully anonymous data that you would never have thought twice about plotting in full in a publication? Yeah, I'm not so sure either. I do wonder if I am perhaps the victim here a little bit of what the popular view might be. I think I hear murmurings all the time of different institutions having different policies around GDPR and what is appropriate data to uh, release into the wild. I hear murmurings of people being able to be decoded from various particularly kinematic measures. There was a pretty startling uh, paper or press release out of uh, somewhere recently looking at uh, decoding people's identity with like devastatingly high accur accuracy from their eye trace patterns in a virtual reality headset and their head movements and things like that. I have to say before I was interested in reproducibility and open science, it never would have occurred to me to plot individual data points anyway. I was one of these scientists who thought you plot the average and you plot the standard deviation or the standard error of the mean. As I moved along my scientific career, I've realized that people are not just interested in you visualizing the effect, but visualizing the actual data so that people can see the caveats to that as well. But I think the precision with which you are able to extract data from a typical graph is probably not that high compared to the two or three decimal place precision of the kinematic variables that we might be extracting from fine grained fingertip force control data or upper limb kinematics. But it's something that I'm really just not that sure on yet. Frankly, I would love to be able to release my data into the wild, but I'm just, I suppose, erring on the side of caution. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, lastly, so it seems to be more of a comment than a question. Uh, someone says, I think that preprints are great. Some papers I have reviewed, I wish I had uh, preprints so I could reference them in my own work before they are published. I have been reading more and more preprints to keep on top of the current directions in my area. So don't give up on them. Um, have you yeah. got any comments? No, I think that's a point well taken. I think that I would certainly never stand in the way of a trainee wanting to release a preprint out there. I think that it's not something I've ever felt all that inclined to do just because I worry, probably slightly arrogantly, I suppose, about the media picking up on something that a peer reviewer changes fundamentally in the peer review process. Now, this is all a, a hypothetical thing because the media doesn't really pick up on my research, nor do peer reviewers fundamentally change the outcome of any of my research when it is under review. But new analyses are added in, phrasing is changed. Generally speaking, the paper itself gets better. 
So I wouldn't say I've given up on them. I'm just not that interested in them. But I suspect I'll get dragged more into this ecosystem as well, particularly when article when uh, Nature Publishing Group starts charging two thousand pounds to send a paper out to review, for example. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think we've gone through um, all the questions uh, we have. Um,